very welcome to all of you on today's uh, webinar, uh, Supporting Positive Behaviors in Children and Teens with Down Syndrome, the Respond but uh, Don't React Method. I would like to say very welcome to Mr. David Stein. Uh, thanks a lot uh, that you accept our call uh, to be our speaker today. Uh, this is very interesting uh, for all of us, especially for the parents. Uh, this uh, part, what you are taking care of for the, a lot of uh, person with Down syndrome. Thanks a lot for this great your job and uh, we will uh, start soon uh, but uh, before we are starting uh, we will just give some uh, information and advice for all participants on uh, today's webinar i will share my screen about a few things Okay, now you could see uh, my screen with presentation. Is everything okay? Okay, uh, today we have a translation into uh, uh, three languages, Turkish, uh, German and the French. And uh, uh, you uh, could have here information how you could uh, set up some uh, some things for this translation. Uh, I will just uh, move and show you how you could uh, put uh, the translation into your own language. Uh, if you see uh, this part on the bottom, uh, you will find there is uh, English, Turkish, but now we have a French as well, like language. And please, uh, for translation, uh, take some of these languages, what is uh, for you uh, suitable. Uh, also, uh, during the webinar, you will just you will uh, just see, able to see and hear only the speakers and the panelists. And you, like participants, uh, we are not uh, at the moment allowed that you are uh, talking or say something. And we support and advise you to uh, put your questions and your comments on the button where is the Q&A. And in that case, uh, all your questions uh, we will uh, handle. Uh, all things what we know from the association, we will tell you or our speaker will answer on the uh, then questions. Uh, next important it is, it is that uh, this meeting is recording and uh, is live broadcast on the Facebook. Also, these records will be shared on the social media accounts on ETSA, on our YouTube, and we will inform later on uh, when it is ready. Uh, uh, today, we will have on the Facebook uh, live stream, and later on, you could uh, watch and uh, uh, see what uh, we have today on this uh, webinar. The webinar is not for the diagnosis and the for treatment. The contents of the femira, webinar reflects the views only of the authors, and the ETS cannot be held responsible for any use which may be made of the information contained therein. You can watch our previous webinars on our YouTube ETS channel on YouTube and also subscribe it. Now I would like to ask uh, Mr. David Stein that uh, he start with uh, his presentation. And uh, if you have uh, some more things before we start, just uh, please tell us. Yes, we see your screen. Yes, okay, please great. take the floor, take the floor. Okay, well, thank you to Dinka and Monica and uh, the organization for inviting me and thank you all for joining us today to talk about behavior and Down syndrome. Uh, whenever I talk about this topic, it's uh, well attended. There's a lot of people interested. And I think, um, you know, I try and do a decent job, but I think it's more a reflection of the fact that uh, most people have dealt with these types of behavior issues. Um, so I wanted to start with a general uh, conversation about what makes people happy. Um, Lots of people have ideas about what makes people happy, but this has actually been studied. Um, and the best study of happiness, in my opinion, is what's called the Harvard Adult Development Study. And this looked at groups of people over their whole life 
and they looked at people who came from very um, poor backgrounds and people who came from very privileged backgrounds attending Harvard University. Um, and what they found is that being healthy matters, your body being healthy, uh, how, how much money you have and how much education you have matter less. But what makes the biggest difference is having good relationships. Um, so in other words, being happy is really about the quality of your relationships in your life. And when we think about behavior management and we think about how to um, help people who are struggling with their behavior, including people with Down syndrome, the first thing that we have to think about is how do we keep our relationship intact and how do we keep that positive? Especially this has been kind of important, I think in the last year and a half with COVID-19, where people have been stuck in the home together without as many family and friends and school um, available for support. So it's a particularly important and difficult time to maintain positive relationships. Now I wanted to give you a little bit of information about me. Um, if we can go back to the year 2002, uh, at that time I was working as what in the US was called a child behavior specialist. And what that really meant is that I was someone that didn't really know much about children and I also didn't know much about behavior, but it was a fancy title to seem like I knew what I was doing. I had um, a degree in psychology and child development, so I thought I knew I would, I, what I was doing, but once I got on the job, I was really bad at this. I was really not very good at managing children's behavior. So my point in telling you that is not to say that, you know, Monica invited the wrong person here to speak today, but it's, it's to say that this is difficult. It's hard work. Um, helping someone with their behavior. And our goal is not for things to be perfect. Our goal is not that someone's gonna have no behavior issues at any point in their life. Our goal is for things to get better. Um, so this is a graph of you know, how we might see behavior playing out over time. This is a similar graph to the stock market where you see things go up and down and up and down, but generally you want things to be getting better. So you might have good days and bad days when you're dealing with behavior issues, but over time, if we can use good strategies, we expect things to con continue to improve. If we're thinking about um, this being a long-term project that we have to work on this over the course of our life, then along the way, we really have to take care of ourselves and our relationships. So sometimes I meet with families and they are consumed by behavior problems. It's all they can think about it's all they can talk about. And that's not sustainable. We can't do that for a long period of time over years and decades. So along the way, I always encourage families and teachers and uh, teach, uh, therapists and doctors, you have to take breaks. You have to take care of yourself. So here, um, if you're familiar in Europe with Popeye the cartoon, this is Popeye and olive oil on their first date. And of course, Popeye loves spinach and olive oil has some spinach in her teeth and she's worried about that, but Papa is very happy that she does. So that's the story of how they got together. Um, so let's back up for a minute and talk about how common these issues are in people with Down syndrome. Talk about the epidemiology of behavior issues in this population. So about 30% of people with Down syndrome, children with Down syndrome, I should say, have behavior that is bad enough that someone like me would have a name for it, a diagnosis. So I would call it a disruptive behavior disorder or ADHD or uh, a movement disorder, et cetera. So 30%. In contrast, only about 10% of kids who do not have Down syndrome have a behavior disorder. So that means by having Down syndrome, your risk of having behavior problems increases by three times, so it's a lot greater. Even more people with Down syndrome struggle with behavior, and I might say it's normal, it's part of their development, it's not uh, something that I would diagnose or have a name for, but it's still probably causing you stress at home or in your classroom or in your clinic. Um, so again, these are very common issues that I hear about all the time. Um, if someone has a behavior problem as a child with a developmental disability, like Down syndrome, that's what DDs mean, they are more likely to have behavior problems when they're an adult. So kids who have behavior problems tend to be more likely to be adults who have behavior problems, 
which is obviously concerning. It's even more concerning that when you look at the research on how people's lives turn out when they get older, people with behavior problems as adults tend to have less success. So they don't live in the community. They don't live in what we call the least restrictive environment or the LRE. They have trouble getting jobs and they have trouble making friends. It makes sense because if you're aggressive or you steal other people's belongings, et cetera, it's gonna be hard for you to live with other people and to work with other people because those behaviors are gonna get in the way. So we could spend the entire childhood of somebody that were you know, a family member or a student or a patient working on their behavior, I'm sorry, working on their development, getting their language skills and their social skills and their academics to be as strong as possible. But if that person has behavior problems, when they get to be an adult, the behavior problems are gonna get in the way of using all those other skills. Um, so this is not to say there's nothing we can do and all is lost. And if you have a child with behavior problems, you know, you're doomed. This is to say, we have to do something. We have to intervene. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the question then becomes why, why does this happen? <clears throat> that's what we call etiology. So the etiology of behavior problems in Down syndrome really come back to the brain. We see a few big differences in the brain in Down syndrome versus kids who do not have Down syndrome. The first one is in this red area where we see reduced growth in the frontal lobes, that very front part of the brain under your forehead. We also see smaller size in the back of the brain under your neck in the brainstem and the cerebellum. And we see issues with the memory centers of the brain, the yellow area, the temporal lobe and the hippocampus. So in the brain, we see some differences. Now the question is how do those differences in the brain actually impact someone's development and their behavior. So what are the consequences of those brain differences in Down syndrome? So <clears throat> socially, we see that people with Down syndrome tend to be more aware of others. They tend to be very engaged with other people. They tend to be more social than young children without Down syndrome, which is a wonderful thing. However, being really, really social and really engaged can also make people really sensitive. So if you're getting good feedback from other people, wonderful. But if other people are giving you negative feedback or they're making you know, negative emotion, that can hit really hard. <clears throat> so the term that I like to use for that is the social and emotional radar. That people with Down syndrome have a very strong radar and they can pick up on other people's emotions. We also tend to see in Down syndrome that people tend to rely on aggression to solve problems. So if you're in a conflict with a classmate or a family member, and you're having trouble with your language or you're having trouble with your impulse control, a lot of times what happens is kids act out and they hit because that's easier and quicker than using a lot of language and planning and thinking ahead about what might happen. So we see a lot of differences socially just based on how the brain is structured. In terms of language, we also see some differences. We see the receptive language, understanding what you're hearing is much stronger for most children than expressive language. So you understand more than you can express. And specifically the challenges that we see with expressive language are with articulation. So can you make the sounds so that other people can understand you? And can you formulate your ideas? Can you get the ideas out so that other people can understand what you're trying to say? So if you take a step back for a moment and you imagine that you're a very social person who's very aware of other people and very interested in other people and you understand a lot of what's happening, <clears throat> excuse me, but you can't say what you think and people can't understand you, you can imagine it's very frustrating, right? If you understand everything that's going around, on around you and you want to be part of it, but you can't say what you wanna say, it's not surprising that people get very frustrated very quickly. Just a little bit more on the brain differences. One more slide. So the next thing we see is in that memory center of the brain, the hippocampus and the temporal lobe, we see problems with information processing and memory. So generally speaking, people with Down syndrome do much better 
processing visual information, pictures, as opposed to words. So visual processing is better than verbal. And we see often that people with Down syndrome tr have trouble with what we call encoding and consolidation, meaning it's hard to get the information into your brain and to have it stay there. So a lot of times people with Down syndrome need things to be repeated a few times. They need repetition. If you think about how that feels to be someone with Down syndrome, it can make the world a kind of scary place, right? Because if you're not understanding a lot of what's happening, you're not taking in the information, then everything seems new and scary and unpredictable because maybe your teacher or your parent or your doctor told you, this is what's coming, this is what's happening next, but you didn't understand or you didn't take that information in, then all of a sudden it feels like a surprise. And now imagine if that happened to you every day, all day, you can imagine the world seems like a pretty scary place. A Couple more brain differences. We're almost done with these. This is the most uh, difficult part of the presentation. The next one is motivation differences. So there are some studies that show that people with Down syndrome have trouble with what we call intrinsic motivation. So that kind of internal drive to get something done, to do something to completion and with good quality. So let's say it's a math worksheet for homework. Maybe they're just not driven to do the whole thing. So that those studies are well done and I, I don't dispute that. But the way that I think about it is that if you have a disability, everything is harder. Everything is harder for you. So if you are being given certain things to do in school and someone else is the, who does not have a disability is getting those same assignments, it's going to take more out of you as the person with the disability. So over time, you're going to become more frustrated. You're going to avoid things because it's just more difficult and you're running out of energy. So I think about it as gas in the tank of a car, right? If you have a person with a disability with a full tank of gas and a person without a disability with a full tank of gas, the person with a disability's gas tank is going faster than the other person because it takes more energy to get through the day. The last area that we can talk about for now is executive functioning. So a lot of times people with Down syndrome have trouble with impulse control. So they don't kind of think about what's the, what's the consequence of this? Maybe I should stop, right? The ball's running across the street, I go get it. Even if my mom told me not to, or my teacher, I'm gonna go get that ball, even if cars are coming because I'm not thinking about what could happen. So a lot of times we see trouble with executive functioning, which lives mostly in the front of the brain, in that frontal lobe. So now if we think about how the world works, especially in 2021, and you think about all the demands we have on kids and how the day is structured at school and at home, it's kind of a perfect storm. It's a, it's a great setup for kids with Down syndrome to be frustrated if we don't give them the right support. So I think it's not surprising that we see so many behavior issues in people with Down syndrome because the world is not really designed for their, the way that their brain works. So now we know why this is happening, but I assume most of you would like to know what can you do about it. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about. We're going to talk about a lot of different things, but not surprisingly, we're going to start with the relationship. So about 100, 120 years ago, people who studied the brain thought that, or the mind, I should say, believed in this thing called drive theory. So basically the belief was everyone is just trying to get their basic needs met. And so children love their parents because their parents feed them and keep them safe, period. And that's the basis of the relationship. In the 1950s, some people came along and said, it seems like it's more complicated than that. Maybe there's more to relationships than just survival. So Harlow in 1959 did an experiment where they had rhesus monkeys, which are very similar to humans in many ways, in a cage and they had two mothers. So one mother was the wire mother uh, on the left. So that's this one over here. And it was the same size and shape as a monkey um, this little robotic head, and it provided food and water. So it provided some basic needs. The other monkey was the terry cloth monkey, and that monkey was the same structure, but wrapped in a terry cloth. 
So um, if drive theory were true and children only love their parents because they kept them alive, then you would expect the monkey to bond, to form a relationship with the wire mother, because that's the one that's made it meeting his or her needs. But what happened in the studies is that they found that the monkeys much preferred the terry cloth mother that looked like a monkey, felt like a monkey, and they developed a bond with that. So this was the start of people saying, you know what, there definitely has to be more to relationships than just survival. So this was the start of what we would call attachment theory. And now I think it would be fair to call it attachment science because we know relationships are very complicated and that there's a huge benefit to both parent and child when there's a positive relationship. We also know that it's not just parents and kids. It's also teachers and doctors and therapists and uncles and aunts and grandparents. Anyone can have a positive relationship with anybody else. So all of those relationships benefit both people. So the child benefits and the grown up benefits. Everyone is happier and healthier by virtue of having that healthy relationship. So the reason I'm going through this in such depth is to say, if behavior is really a problem in your household or your classroom, think about what should you do to preserve the relationship? How can you make the relationship as positive as possible despite all the behavior issues, right? So you can imagine yelling and screaming and all those things that we know we shouldn't do are not helpful, right? So we have to think about the relationship first and foremost, and that's gonna benefit you, and it's also gonna benefit the child. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is behavior principles. Um, it took me a year to learn this because um, I'm not as smart as all of you. So um, I'm gonna teach it to you in about 30 seconds. So here's how behavior works. It's very easy to understand, but it's hard to carry it out every day. So here we go. You reinforce the behaviors you want to see more of, and you do not reinforce the behaviors you want to go away. That's it. Reinforce means make it happen again. Make it fun, make it interesting, right? If I gave you a candy every time you did something good, that would be reinforcing the behavior and it would happen more and more and more, right? So we reinforce the behaviors we want. We don't reinforce the behaviors we, get, we, want, we want to go away. And that's it. That's how behavior works. Here we have Pavlov with his dogs and the dogs have turned the tables on him. So they say, are saying to each other, watch what I can make Pavlov do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. So they are training and conditioning Pavlov. Okay, so how do we reinforce good behavior? What do we do to accomplish that? The first thing we do is we pay attention to it. If you notice behaviors, good behaviors, they are going to happen more and more. So again, give a candy, which is actually not a good example because we don't like to use food to reinforce, but if we just notice a behavior, it's gonna happen more. That's called the Hawthorne effect. This is how Weight Watchers works. Weight Watchers is a big, uh, very successful program in the US for people to lose weight, which obviously is a big issue here. And in Weight Watchers, what you do is you write down everything that you eat and you go to meetings with other people who are doing the same thing. So they support you. So it's there's a social aspect where you're getting support from friends. But the big thing is that you're paying attention. You're noticing how much you eat instead of just eating and then hoping for the best. And of course, what happens is people eat less because they're paying attention to it. So the behavior changes. If you think about people with Down syndrome, again, being very, very social in general, paying attention to their behavior is even more powerful. It has even more of an impact. So just noticing the good behaviors is gonna make them happen more. The other thing we can do is praise, right? We can say, wow, I love how you cleaned up your bedroom tonight. I love how you got your pajamas on. I love how you ate your breakfast, et cetera, right? So we can say, I like how you did that specific thing. And then that will behavior will happen more and more. Um, how else can we reinforce good behavior? And maybe we can do it in a little more structured way. So that's what we call a token economy. So a token economy is something that sounds difficult. It sounds fancy, but it's really not. 
we're basically picking a few goals, a few things that we would like somebody to do. We're building a structure around it and we're rewarding them for doing it. So it's very simple and I'm gonna give you an example in just a minute. A lot of times when people are trying to create something like this, a behavior chart, they make it very complicated. That's not the way to go. We want it to be as simple as possible. So what I do is when kids walk into my office and they have a behavior plan, I turn to the child and I say, how does this work? Explain this to me. And you'd be surprised. A lot of times kids say, I have no idea how this works, right? I don't know what to do. And that's, that's a problem, right? If we want a child to respond to something, they have to understand it. So complicated behavior plans do not mean a good or effective behavior plan. The last thing I'll say before I show you one is that it's not just for kids, it's for us, it's for the adults. When kids are having behavior problems, we, the grownups, tend to notice all of the bad behavior. Every bad behavior gets to us and gets, gets us frustrated, so we notice all of them. What a good behavior plan does is it reminds us, the adults, to notice the good behaviors. Say, even if it's a bad day or you're having a tough time, if you do something good, we will notice and we will respond to that. So here is a sim sample um, token economy, very, very simple. So what we have here is um, a kiddo who's got to get ready for bed and she, we want to give her a few jobs to do. So I sat with the, the student, with this little girl, and I said, what are your jobs at bedtime? She said, well, I have to take a bath. I have to brush my teeth. I have to put on my pajamas. So we went online and we looked up pictures of bath time and pajamas and brushing your teeth. And she picked the pictures. And then we put it into a little chart. And her parents check the box when she does each thing. And then she gets a prize. And that's it. It's not hard, right? But you'd be surprised that something simple like this can lead to big changes in kids' behavior because all of a sudden they know what they're supposed to do and they know you're going to notice it and they know they're going to be rewarded for it. So it really can have a big impact. Why does this work so well? Well, we're doing all the things that we decided are helpful for people with Down syndrome and how their brain works. It's visual, right? There are pictures. Every day there's a picture of what you need to do. There's repetition, it's the same every day, right? Just like yesterday, I need you to do those three things, those are your jobs. We have built in motivation, right? There's a reward, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. We're also giving them social feedback, we're giving them attention. You did that and I like it, yay, good job, here's the check mark, all right, let's get your prize. And the last thing is that we're supporting the relationship because we're taking the pressure off of you as a mom or a dad to say, brush your teeth, get your pajamas on, get in the bathtub, blah, 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 on and on, right? That is stressful. That is you and your child butting heads and fighting, right? And you say over and over, come on, do it, get it take, take a bath. And they say, no, take a bath, no, right? Instead of you going back and forth over and over, you're just saying, your routine is on the wall. The picture's right there, you know what to do. I'm not gonna go into it with you, that's it, right? So it's basically structuring what you want from kids in a way that really works for their brain. One thing I wanna talk about is what should the prize be? A lot of times people think it should be food, but we don't want food to be a reward or a punishment, right? Food is something that we need to, to live. So we don't want it to be food. Oftentimes people think it should be toys, right? But you're not gonna buy a toy every day even if it's a cheap toy or a sticker, right? Stickers lose interest after a while. So take a moment and think about what would be the best reward for this group of people based on how their brains work. You're all correct, you got it. Social rewards, right? Something from you. So playing a game with you, watching a show with you, reading a book with you, something that's social in nature, it's free. You can do it every day and it doesn't get old, right? So it's something that you can keep using that you are the reward, some social interaction and feedback. So again, this is a very simple tool, but it can really work wonders for this group of people. Now we're gonna talk about the functions of a behavior. 
So every behavior has a purpose. And if we're going to address a negative behavior or a problem behavior, we have to understand what the purpose of that behavior is. So this is called a learning trial or the ABCs of learning. So this is the antecedent, which comes before the behavior. There's the behavior itself. And then there's the consequence or what happens after the behavior to keep it going. So when we look in depth at these kinds of things using what's called a functional behavior assessment, where people evaluate why is the behavior happening, um, the big ones that we find are number one, escape and avoidance. So when something is hard, it makes sense that as a human being, someone with Down syndrome is going to want to avoid that. So oftentimes math is the most difficult subject for this group of people. So lo and behold, math starts in math class starts, kids run out of the classroom, right? It's not a surprise. It's very difficult. So I'm going to avoid it. We can also avoid the end of things that we do like. So let's say you're at a birthday party and your child doesn't want to leave. They might drop to the floor and refuse to move, right? Which we call stop and flop. So again, we are avoiding something unpleasant or avoiding the end of something that is pleasant. The other big one that we see is attention seeking. So I used to work in a big hospital and we used to have, you know, have the parents come in and talk to them with the child waiting and we'd give the child some toys to play with um, while we talked. And of course, the kids were bored. They didn't like that the grownups were talking about them. Um, it was a tough setup. So as a result, what happened is a lot of times the kids would run over and turn off the lights. So now instead of us ignoring them and giving them toys that are not very fun to play with, everyone's paying attention to them. So they're getting the attention that they're seeking. Another one is in young kids, we see this very frequently, who are struggling with language. And instead of asking a friend to play or trying to solve problems that way, they might hit, right? So if I don't know how to ask you to play or you can't understand me, I might go over and hit you instead because I need a way to communicate. With you. So why are those the common causes of behavior in Down syndrome? Well, the first reason is if you have lower intrinsic motivation, if things are just harder for you, it makes sense that you're going to avoid them. So it makes sense. You're going to say, get me out of here. I don't want to do that. Similarly, if you're very social, and you don't have good control of your impulses, it makes sense that you might do some things that you shouldn't do to get some attention because you're not thinking about the consequences, right? You're not thinking about if I hit, I'm gonna get in trouble, I'm gonna lose recess or et cetera. So what can we do then to help kids with these types of behaviors? Well, when kids are struggling with motivation, we have a lot of different tools that we can use to help them do what they need to do. Some of these may be familiar to you. So there are a lot of these in the book, which I'm gonna um, mention later again and, and tell you a little bit more about. But for now, these are a few of the most powerful ones. The first one is giving kids choices. So everyone take a step back for a moment and think about your child or, or grandchild or student or patient who has Down syndrome. Now think about that person when they're an adult. Do you want that adult with Down syndrome to do what anyone tells them to do? Or do you want them to have agency? Do you want them to feel, no, 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 I decide for myself what I'm gonna do and I need to be safe and I need to be healthy and I need to figure out what I want, right? So I assume most of you are thinking to yourself, yeah, I want things, I want my, loved one with Down syndrome to make some of their own decisions to be, be empowered, right? So that's wonderful. Now let's go back to reality and right now where you're gonna start doing bedtime after we're done with this presentation and you say, time to use the bathroom and your child says, no, I'm not using the bathroom, right? In that moment, are you thinking about, oh, I really want you to be you know, empowered and to have agency and have a say, no, you're saying you just need to use the bathroom, it's late, I need to go to bed, right? So in those moments, even though we want kids to get things done and we have to get on with our lives, kids are expressing their independence. 
we need to honor that. We need to say, all right, we understand that you want some control. So a way that we can achieve both goals of getting that child to bed and giving them some independence is to give them some choices, right? To say, well, do you want to brush your teeth first or do you want to use the potty first? Either one's fine, right? Both are okay. You choose. So now the child is saying, oh, great. I'll use the potty first and then I'll brush my teeth. You're still getting things going. You're still getting that child to bed, but they are feeling empowered and like they have choice. And all of a sudden there's no argument. There's no problem. Another one is called redirection. Redirection means that if some, if a behavior is starting and you're starting to see a problem brewing, let's say the kids are fighting over the iPad or the TV or whatever, um, instead of punishing them and saying, no, no one's using the iPad, you're both in trouble, go to your room, blah, blah, blah. Instead of that, you're redirecting the behavior. You're saying, okay, let's stop that. You come help me set the table. Come help me with dinner. And all of a sudden, instead of dealing with a negative behavior, we have changed the situation and now we're dealing with something positive. So this is really powerful. And if you notice the way that I'm describing it is not to say you're doing something negative, go to your room. We're saying, instead of doing that negative thing, come be with me, come socialize, come engage with me, help me, right? Kids love to help. They love to feel like they're important, like they're part of the, the family or the classroom. So I always say, not just go to your room and do something else, but come be with me, right? And then instead of dealing with a bad behavior and punishing and saying, oh no, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Now we're saying, wow, thank you. You helped me set the table. Now dinner is ready and you're genuinely happy and your child with Down syndrome can sense that. They sense, oh wow, dad's really happy that I helped him. I feel good about myself. And now instead of a negative reaction or a negative interaction, we have a positive one, which is only gonna help your relationship. We also find that we can motivate kids by pairing something they don't like with something that they do like. So if you have something that a child doesn't wanna do, for example, in this case, it was homework, um, let's figure out something that he does wanna do. So in this case, again, child didn't want to do homework. This is a real story. And the parents were really struggling with this. So we discovered that the child loved this show in the U.S. called Cash Cab, which is a trivia show where people are driving around in a taxi cab and they have to answer trivia questions. It was kind of a funny show for a kiddo to like. But we discovered that he loved it. So we said, all right, if you want to do homework, I'm sorry, if you want to watch Cash Cab, First, you have to do your homework. So first homework and then cash cab. All of a sudden, this little boy is doing all his homework as fast as he can because he wants to watch cash cab. So we're taking something that he doesn't like and pairing it with something that he does like, and now we have a better behavior. Um, okay. So next, if we think about attention seeking, if that's the driver of a behavior or the function of a behavior, we have a really easy option to intervene. So let's take an example. Joshua loves to go into his sister's room and jump on the bed. And when he does that, his sister and his dad get really upset. They run into the room. Josh laughs and laughs and keeps going until his dad throws him over his shoulder and takes him out of their room, right? Does this sound familiar? You see a really bad behavior that's getting a lot of attention. So you just have to kind of drag the kid away. So think for a second to yourselves, what is the function of this behavior? You're right, it's attention seeking, good job. And what is reinforcing the behavior? He's getting the attention, right? Dad and sister are getting really upset and they're coming and reacting, right? So they're reacting to the behavior, they're giving him the attention. What could they do differently? You're right again, they could do nothing. So this is a real story of a family that came to see me and they had waited months and months and they told me about this problem. And I said, well, what if you did nothing? And they looked at each other and said, we waited six months to see this guy. What is he talking about, right? And we joked a little bit about it. But then I said, no, really, I think you're getting so upset is the reason this behavior is continuing. So what if you stopped getting so upset and you didn't do anything, right? So what happened? The next day, Joshua did it more and more and more. That's called the extinction burst. 
he wanted to do it more to see if he could get his dad and his sister to get really upset. But then the second day, he didn't do it at all because it wasn't fun anymore. Nobody was getting upset. Jumping on the bed got old because no one really cared if he did it. So all of a sudden the behavior was gone. So whenever I talk about ignoring behaviors or letting them go, people every single time bring up this concern of, well, you can't ignore every behavior. You can't let everything go, which is exactly correct. So the way that I like to think about ignoring is to use um, Ross Green's model from a book called The Explosive Child. I don't really like the title of the book, but I like the concept. So the way that I understand it is that there are these different baskets of ignoring, so or baskets of behavior. So basket one would be something that's a safety issue. So something that um, like running into the street or hurting somebody else's body, you have to intervene. That child cannot run off into the street, that's dangerous. And there are ways to stop them without reinforcing the behavior, which we're gonna talk about, but you need to intervene and you need to keep your child safe. That's basket one. Basket two is something that's frustrating and it's something that's on your mind, but you either let it go or you intervene depending on the timing. So for example, years ago, I saw a family where the little boy was refusing to eat dinner with his family at the dinner table. So they were very frustrated by this and they really wanted to do something about it. But they also told me that the same little boy was chasing his sisters around the state, on the, around the house, excuse me, with knives. So I said to them, I think we need to deal with the knives before we deal with where he eats dinner, right? We can't do it all at once. And that's a much bigger priority. That's very unsafe and scary. And what did we do about the steak knives? We did something really genius. We locked the cabinet. We put them in a cabinet and we put a lock on it and that's it, right? So sometimes it's the simplest thing that really works. And we don't have to be super creative or do this professionally to realize, you know what? If the knives are dangerous, get rid of the knives, lock them up. Um, basket three are behaviors that if you really take a step back and, and think about what the impact is, they're not really causing any harm. You can ignore those behaviors. You can just let them go. So a lot of times this would be like humming or clicking your tongue or some of the kind of things that parents or teachers might find annoying, but they're not really harming anyone. So if we just let them go, a lot of times they go away. So in my opinion, these things are simple. These are not difficult to understand. A lot of them are not all that difficult to do. But when you're upset, when you're frustrated as a grown up, it's hard to do them in that moment. So this is a picture of me in 2002 when I felt like a drill sergeant. I was really just frustrated by kids' behavior. And I would say, no, don't do that. You get a timeout. And they would still do it. And I say, now you need another timeout. It didn't matter, right? That didn't have any effect on their behavior. I wasn't thinking about it in the right way. So now let's talk about how to focus on and leverage the strengths to make the environment a little more friendly for this group of people. To start, let's revisit how the brain works in this group. So we know that there are strengths in visual processing of information and verbal processing or speaking is harder. We know that social engagement is very strong, but impulse control is a weakness. And we know that things being routine and predictable and the same every day is helpful, but inconsistency is not. So if we think about that, and we think about the world we live in, how can we use the knowledge of the brain and Down syndrome to adapt the environment and bring out the best in people with Down syndrome? The first thing we can do is make a routine that provides sameness. So make the world more predictable, support that memory, right? Make kids less anxious. They know what's coming and it's not so scary. If we can make that routine visual, we're even another step ahead of the game. So here is a visual schedule. So this is a morning routine where we're just showing a child, this is what we want you to do. This is what happens in the morning. And let's get through these steps. And again, just like with the token economy, instead of you as the parent running around the house saying, now do this, now do that, now do this, now do that, it's saying, 
Here, there it is on the wall. Just read what you have to do and get it done, right? That's the end of it. We can also help kids with time. Time is a very abstract concept. So to say, you know, you have to do your homework for 10 minutes or we're leaving the house in 20 minutes can be difficult. So you can use, in the US, we have a lot of microwaves. You can use the microwave timers. You can use what's called a time timer, um, which is a visual timer. We also can use social motivators and rewards. So again, if we want kids to do things, we can use us. We can use attention from us. Wow, I really need you to clean up. What? Oh, wow, that's such great cleaning up. I love it. That's awesome. Or we can say, first you clean up, and then I'm going to play with you, right? So we're using the social motivation to help kids um, do their best. When we're faced with more difficult situations, um, such as going to the doctor, going to new school, we can use the same idea of adding structure and adding visuals and repetition. And we can use something called social stories or what's called video modeling. So a social story is another concept that sounds difficult and complicated, but it's not. It's a, it's a picture book with mostly pictures and just a few words. It's very simple. We're showing what we want to happen. So the sequence of events. We're showing what behaviors we want to see. So the good behaviors that we're hoping for. And we're doing it over and over and over. We're doing like as a bedtime story. So here's a story about getting a sleep study, right? We had lots of kids when I worked at a big hospital that were struggling with sleep studies. So the department developed this book where it showed this is exactly what happens. This is what it all looks like. So that when kids came, they had read that book 20, 30, 40 times, and they knew what to expect. And instead of being scared and dropping to the floor and refusing to do anything, they'd say, oh yeah, now you're gonna measure my head. Oh yeah, now I gotta lie down, right? So they knew what was coming and they were less scared and they were more cooperative. The same kind of concept works with video modeling where we're taking a video of the situation and showing that to kids over and over and over again. So I go into the dentist's office, I sit in the big chair, they put a bib on me, they stick a poker in my mouth and scrape and clean, um, that kind of thing, which can help kids just know what's coming. It's called a schema. We're building a mental map in their brain of what to expect. And again, that makes it less scary. So now that we know how the brain works in Down syndrome, we also know what things to avoid. So the first one is talking too much, right? So if things are not going well and you're dealing with a problem behavior, a lot of times what we do as adults is we go on and on and on and we talk and we talk and we talk. So for example, Jonathan hit his sister. Now, Jonathan, there's no hitting in his house. If you hit, you'll be in a timeout, blah, 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 right? Or we could just say no hitting, right? Short and sweet, not a lot of words. We also know that not having a routine and keeping things inconsistent makes kids anxious, makes kids unclear of what's expected and can really lead to problems. And then finally, we know that giving social responses for behaviors that we don't want to see can make it worse, right? So if we get upset, if we react very strongly to a negative behavior, we might actually be sending the message, oh, that's a fun behavior, you should keep doing that and it's gonna happen more and more and more. So we have to be really careful about ourselves. So that brings us to effective discipline. If you notice, we've been speaking for an hour about behavior and we haven't talked about discipline. We haven't talked about punishment, right? Because when we're dealing with behavior, positive behavior supports are much more effective. So here's a little boy in his room, he just got punished, but he has his phone, he has his video games, he has his basketball hoop, he has his TV. And he's talking to his friend and he's saying, this is great. If they want to punish me, they should have sent me somewhere else, right? He's having a good time. So punishment often doesn't work. And why is that? Like I said, positive behavior supports getting ahead of the behavior and preventing the negative behavior works much better than punishment and waiting for the behavior to happen. This is even more true for people with Down syndrome, in my opinion, because think about how do you feel when you're punishing a child? Are you saying, no, Rosie, it's okay. You don't, don't hit your sister. That is not allowed in this house. Now you have a timeout. 
No, you've probably said it 10 times and you're saying, Rosie, stop hitting your sister. There's no hitting in this house. You're going to hurt her. Go get her. Right? You're very upset. So again, that anger, that frustration, that emotion sends the wrong message. It's reinforcing. It's sending the message, ooh, this is fun. I just got daddy really upset. So again, we often discipline when we're angry and those things can be reinforcing. So discipline or punishment comes back to the idea of how does behavior work in general? And that is we reinforce the things you want to happen, do not reinforce the things you want to go away. So again, if it's a good behavior, react to it. If it's a bad behavior, we have to be careful. Reinforcement means adding. We want to add to the behavior. So if the good behavior is happening, add attention, add a reward, add social responses. If a behavior is not a good behavior, we want to take things away. We want to make it less fun and interesting. So how do we do that? Well, if we think about how kids with Down syndrome's brains work, what would we want to remove? What do people think? This is such a smart group, Monica. You are all right again. We want to remove us. We want to remove the social. So if a child with Down syndrome is acting out, we want to take away our eye contact. I'm not looking. I'm not looking at you right now. We want to take away our language. I'm not talking. I'm, I'm not giving this attention. I'm staying calm. I'm not raising my voice. I'm not making strong facial expressions, right? All of those things are sending signals to the brain. Wow, this is fun and exciting, which is not what we want to be doing. So we have to be careful of that social and emotional radar that if we get too upset and we send those signals, we might be inadvertently reinforcing the behavior. Our faces can say a lot. This is a figure skater who is very unhappy with her score from the US Olympic team. And after she was interviewed, she said, oh, I was fine with the score, but her face told a different story. So when you have to react to behaviors, or when you have to intervene rather, you want to respond to the behavior, but you don't have to react to it emotionally. So we can remove our eye contact. We can remove our facial expressions. We can remove the child. We can say, this is a bad situation and we're gonna go. Or we can say, you're not behaving. We're gonna remove the other people from the situation so that this is not a dangerous situation. Or we can use what's called response cost. We can say, you're acting out with the dog. You're hitting the dog. Now the dog is going away. So because of the behavior, there's a cost. Dog's gone. So it's similar to timeout because all timeout is, is we're removing the things that make the behavior fun and interesting. We're removing the reinforcers, but it's not the usual timeout. Um, so we've talked about a lot of different things today um, and a lot of different strategies. And I am hopeful that a lot of these strategies can be helpful to you even today. You know, giving your child choices, using redirection, setting up a little visual schedule and or a token economy. These things are easy. You could do them today. And I think it will help. But sometimes things are not so simple and you need more help. So where do you go? The first place we can go is to a behaviorist. It's called a functional behavior assessment. So someone that's gonna look at those behaviors and determine why they're happening and what you can do about it. The second thing would be um, to make sure that your child is healthy, right? To make sure there's nothing going on medically that's causing those behaviors like a sleep problem or a diet problem or a, you know issues with hearing or vision. Um, and then you can do what I spend most of my time doing is which is neuropsych testing and developmental testing, looking at, well, how is this child's brain working? How does that match with their school, their environment, and what are the issues? What, what could be causing these behaviors? We need to figure out, is there something else going on? Is there a behavior disorder? Is there a psychiatric disorder? Like I said, is there a sleep issue? Is there a diet issue? Is there an, an issue with the environment? So is the classroom causing some problems? Have the, has the child experienced losses? Because we know kids with Down syndrome are very exquisitely sensitive, 
and connected to other people. So sometimes even a loss of someone like a teacher or an assistant in the classroom or a speech pathologist, those things can have a big impact. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that there is a book. Um, so the book is the same title as this uh, presentation, Supporting Positive Behavior in Children and Teens with Down Syndrome, the Respond But Don't React Method. It has a lot of this information, but goes into a lot more depth. The purpose of the book was to be accessible and easy for parents, especially. So it's not long, it's easy to read because parents are busy. When I started working with kids, I would give parents book suggestions. Sometimes the books were 500 pages and the parents almost never read them because parents are busy. So when I was writing this, I wanted to write something that parents could actually get through and get help right away. So that was the goal. And I think it worked out pretty well. Um, the book is in English and in Spanish and in Dutch. Um, so if we think about how can we help a child with their behavior, we have to understand how a child sees the world, how their brain works, and how they learn. And if we understand that, then we're going to be much more effective in helping that child do their best behaviorally. For kids with Down syndrome, in my opinion, we have a head start. We know for most kids with Down syndrome, not all, but for most, these are some themes. So we know certain things are gonna be helpful. Um, so it's kind of nice that we, we have a bit of a head start, as I said, this is just a cute kid. Um, so some closing points for you. If you can focus on the repositive, focus on your relationship, and focus on the strengths of a child, that will help you choose the best behavior strategies to help them do their best. The goal is not perfection. The goal is for things to get better over time. And the end point of all this is not tomorrow, it's not next month, it's for the person with Down syndrome to have a good life and to have a good adulthood that's not limited by their behavior, right? So all the investment that you're making now in a child's language and social skills and academic skills and daily living skills and job skills, job skills, job skills, because those are a huge predictor of outcomes. We don't wanna waste all that effort. We want kids to, to enjoy all their hard work as adults and not have behavior get in the way. So now um, I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, David, thanks a lot. Uh, it was very, very interesting. And uh, thanks a lot that you show also the books, uh, because uh, I guess that most of us uh, uh, read your book and they help us so much, uh, all the information what you put in uh, the book. Uh, we have uh, several questions and uh, okay, they're more or less uh, in English, maybe if you could uh, also open the Q&A, maybe it will be much faster than uh, sure. I uh, read everything. Uh, maybe uh, we could start uh, with some of these uh, 12 from the hope and side, and then uh, we'll see, we have one in the answer, uh, what is uh, one mother wrote us even before your webinar, uh, she explained very detailly uh, problem, problems uh, that their uh, child has. But let's start uh, from the from the first one. Uh, this how, hello, I'm wondering the best course of the action when it comes to addressing the behavior that is around self-stimulation. Uh, um, okay, child or boy is a, a girl is adolescent. Could you give maybe some more things about sure. this than you already said? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing to remember is that self-stimulation in an adolescent is normal. It's normal behavior. It's not, you know, inherently a problem. Um, it's usually only a problem when it's happening in places where it shouldn't happen, right? So it's a private thing. So usually what you want to try and focus on with that is defining and limiting where and when that happens. So if you need to do that, it happens in your bedroom with the door closed, you know, not in the classroom, not out in public, not at the dinner table. So it's really about limiting. So it's it's not saying to a, an adolescent, you can't do that. 
because an adolescent boy without Down syndrome, that would be a healthy, normal behavior, just has to be in the right time in the right place. So that's the same thing for someone with a disability. Um, you might have to do things like a social story um, and think about um, how to express that to a child. But again, I, I think that's really the, the way to go. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, our next question, it is from, uh, from Kate. Okay, seven year the uh, child with Down syndrome. Okay, it's brilliant, routines, uh, can repeat what, uh, but want to, uh, won't do what he knows and should be doing himself. Any tips how to deal with this? Yeah, well, I hope, Kate, that as you watch the presentation, I think we answered this, right? So I would use the tools that we talked about. I would use a token economy and I would set up a, some visuals and say, these are the jobs for the morning. These are the jobs for the afternoon. These are the jobs for the evening and build in rewards throughout the day. And again, the rewards shouldn't be food or you know, toys, it can just be like privileges or a special time with a parent or a teacher or a sibling or a friend. But just to say, you know, this is what we want you to do. And if you do it, you get a reward. And I would have it be visual. Um, so even though he's a very verbal kiddo who's doing great with speech, I would still make it visual and I would make it external. So instead of it, you saying this is what you have to do, make it an external structure like hung up on the wall so that he can do it without your telling him. Yep, thanks a lot. Uh, we have another question. Have you noticed that uh, this child attachment takes longer before it expresses itself? Um, so I'll, I'll try and answer this. I'm not totally sure I understand, but I assume you mean like a, an attachment, you know, yeah. parent and child. Um, so no, generally speaking, I wouldn't expect that. Um, it's a little, so one thing that I'll say to everybody is that I will happily talk about some general themes, but, you know, in this case for John and Claudia, I would have a lot more questions for you before I could really weigh in. Um, if you have concerns about attachment and social engagement, I think it would make sense to talk to your pediatrician about that or talk to the Down syndrome, you know, specialist that you may see. Um, and you know, look at how your child is starting to socially engage. I wouldn't expect that, but again, it, it may be fine. I, I just would need more information. And I would recommend that you discuss yeah. that again with your pediatrician yes. or a specialist. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question is from Janice. We had you recommended doing token economy charts for all activities or just for that uh, child uh, is uh, struggling? Yeah, that's a great question. So. You know, if something is going well, then maybe leave it alone and maybe just focus on the bedtime routine. I don't think you have to do a token economy at all if it's not a problem um, and things are going well. But, you know, often what I do is in your case, I might do a visual schedule in the morning, just saying like, yeah, there are all the things that you do. And then in the morning, maybe make it a token economy where there's a reward and a motivator built in. Um, when you're doing a token economy, one thing to keep in mind is that you want kids to be successful. So you want it to be easy at first. So it's not like only make it things that are difficult. So for you, Janess, um, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name properly. Uh, I, would, yep. I would start by saying, you know, let's say you're picking three or four jobs, maybe make two of those jobs easy ones that you know he can do and he likes to do, and then one difficult one so that you start with some success. You want him to get the reward every day. So he likes it and it's an enjoyable thing. And then you can over time, make it a little harder, add another job, but having jobs that are successful and that he can do, that's a good thing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Another uh, question is from uh, Petria. Would you please address uh, impulse control? How may I help my doctor to stop and think before acting? How may I guide teachers to recognize impulse control? So that's a really good question. There's not really a way that you can, you know, um, impose impulse control on a child. It's something that, you know, develops later um, for most people. It's it's kind of lives in the front of the brain and the brain develops from the back of your head to the front. So it's one of the last things to really fully develop. Um, 
so, you know, it's really about having parents and teachers kind of manage what behaviors are getting her into trouble and kind of preventing them and getting ahead of them. The other, um, you know, sometimes people, if, if you go to your doctor and you do an evaluation, um, sometimes we see kids with Down syndrome with ADHD where they have a lot of trouble with impulse control that can happen. And then, you know, there are medicines and things like that. But again, I, I am not speaking specifically about your child um, because I would need a lot more information um, to make such a determination. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we have a question from Kay. Do you have any thoughts on reflex integration and modalities such as the rhythmic moment training for people with Down syndrome? Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't know anything about that. And I, I have not heard of that technique. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Kate, continue with the question. Another one is, uh, I have found the safest sound protocol very helpful for my very children, extremely strong, wild seven year old. He's so much more compliant when he has completed the protocol, but the results don't hold for long. Do you have any insight on why? why this would be yeah well it's a long-term thing right it's not a like we talked about in the beginning it's not a quick fix there is no quick fix for this kind of stuff it's over years and years building positive behaviors reinforcing them nurturing them so i don't think it's a surprise that it's like you know help short term and then goes away so i i don't know that protocol i don't know if it's something that you can just keep doing but that's why the stuff that i'm talking about you know, is easy to implement. You can do it over time. You can keep doing it. Um, and, you know, you can change it. You can change the goals. You can change the rewards. You can change the, um, the uh, jobs that you're working on, but um, it's, there's no quick fix. It's, it, um, so that's not surprising, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question we has. Okay, it's thanks for a really interesting presentation. Uh, that's I think all of us could say as well. Okay, my little boy with Down syndrome is seven, but older brother is a nine, and this older uh, brother, young, sometimes very frustrated with his younger brother, and can tend to give out of him, try to parent him. We would love for them to have a friend relationship without uh, him trying to constantly correct his younger brother. What would you advise so that we can achieve this? Yeah, that's a hard one. You know, that's a common pattern in siblings of people with disabilities is that they kind of take on that parent role. And a lot of times just an older sibling takes on that role anyway. So I don't think it's all a bad thing. You know, it could be a good thing. And a lot of times you see siblings of people with disabilities, you know, be very responsible and mature and there are some benefits. I think I would just, you know, kind of consistently remind him and say, you know, it's okay, mommy and daddy can, will be the ones to discipline him and will be the ones to manage that and you you don't need to do that. Um, I think there, you know, I don't think you can stop it completely. I think you could, um, I think, um, some consistent messaging over time that, you know, you want him to be a child and it's not his responsibility is good. But I also think that, you know, it's probably gonna be hard to completely stop that. And there may be some benefits to him in the long run. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, it's possible, uh, okay, okay, we will answer all this. Uh, child with CP, I don't know what Paula means of this one. David, could you? from this just word i really can't What's say uh yeah child with cp Cerebral uh, palsy, no down I, yeah i don't see a question there i don't see i don't see as well okay we have one i think is in turkish i will need help later on please uh, somebody who could translate us this turkish question uh, okay, this is uh, again Paola. From what I have had, some strategy can be used in cognitive disabilities when the child has a serious behaviors problems. Yeah, I, I agree. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about is just you know basic behavior management, um, especially for people with disabilities. Um, provided that the child is social, I think a lot of the stuff we talked about would work very well, and I don't think it would do any harm. Um, so they're just kind of good strategies. Um, 
so yes, I think that would be appropriate in general. Uh, yes, uh, I think I have a, a translation of this Turkish part. Oh, okay. I I will need really help about this. Okay, okay. Tolga, could you uh, could you wrote that? Uh, could you read this part about uh, Turkish part? Tolga, could you do that now or when I finish? I wrote from chat. Okay. Yes. Uh, three, three, brought... three question. Yeah. Yes, we had three questions from uh, Turkish families. Okay, one question. My uh, six-year-old uh, son leaves the house announced when we are not close to the door of the house and goes out to the street. What to do to prevent this? I would, I would put a lock on the door, a child lock. Um, you know, uh, you have to keep kids safe. So as long as it's safe for your family and, you know, you have to make sure that it's legal and, you know, fire hazards and all that kind of stuff. But if you can do it safely, I would put a child lock on the door that he can't get out without a grown up. Um, so sometimes just putting a pie or a specific child lock um, or a combination lock or something like that. Um, and then, you know, you, in addition to the lock, you could try and do social stories where you talk about not going out without a grown up. Um, and then also sometimes I've put like a sign on the door, like a stop sign on the door just to just rem give a visual reminder. No, we don't do that. Um, yeah. So, but the big thing is to try and prevent it from happening at all. Yes. Another question is, uh, okay, your comments. My son is nine years old. We have a hard time setting boundaries. It is uh, highly tolerated in the social environment. The borders disappear. We find it difficult to cooperate with other educators. What kind of the path should we follow? So I, could you say, could you just repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, my son is uh, nine years old. We have a hard time setting boundaries. It is highly tolerated in the social environment. The borders disappear. We find it difficult to cooperate with other educators. What kind of the path should we follow? So that's a little bit hard for me to answer, you know, without a lot more information. Um, I don't know what kind of boundaries, you know, I, I think in general, the idea would be for the parents and the teachers to have similar strategies. So to like, you know, have the same kinds of things, visuals, token economies uh, at home and at school to be doing ignoring as much as possible to be redirecting. Um, so I would say like both sets of people have to use similar strategies so that, you know, um, you can kind of get some consistency. Um, and the last from Turkish group, it's uh, you mentioned uh, that you do developmental behavioral testing. Do you have any suggestion for international ones? That's somebody else doing that as well. You do you I, know? I don't know, honestly. I'm sure that people in Europe are doing uh, neuropsych testing. That's what we call it here. Um, I'm sure that's happening. I just don't know off the top of my head where that's happening, but I, I'm sure it exists in Europe. Yeah, thanks. We will come back now to this question and air. Okay, we, okay, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes at least, uh, we will try to comment uh, this uh, question and then we would like to close for today if it's okay for everybody. I know it's very interesting, but uh, it's really so many maybe uh, similar things even in the, this question, new one, but let's continue. How do you uh, deal with the child who is spitting when he doesn't want to do something? Um, yeah, so that's a challenging one. Um, again, I would try and motivate him to do the things that he needs to do um, with, you know, pairing it with something positive that he likes, motivating him, doing some, you know, visuals. Um, if uh, you might also want to take a step back and think about are the things that we're asking him to do appropriate or too difficult because when kids act out over and over and over again, sometimes we have to kind of look at ourselves and say, is what I'm asking fair? You know, maybe it's not a good match for this child's skill set or abilities. 
So you, that's another consideration is, you know, number one, can you motivate him in other ways? Number two, should you adjust what you're asking him to do? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, next question is in German. I would like to ask Monica Okora to be ready to read that one. Translate. I will uh, um, read now Sandra comments. My 12-year-old uh, uh, is greeting his teeth. Now lately he's making lots of oral sounds instead. Very socially disruptive. What we do? We do. So, you know, if you if you told me it would, they were grinding his grinding his teeth and it was annoying, I would say just let it be, as long as the dentist said his teeth were okay. Um, if it's causing social problems, then maybe you want to think about doing something creative. So uh, what we usually think about in situations like that is called the replacement behavior. So what could he do instead that wouldn't cause social problems? The big one that I would think about is called. Uh, is uh, differential reinforcement of another behavior. Um, so a big one would be, um, they have like, it's called jewelry. So there's jewelry, like a necklace that you can wear with something that you're meant to chew on on the end. So, you know, if he just needs something kind of stimulating in his mouth, you could just kind of, you know, you would, you at home and the teachers, every time that's happening, you would say, oh, you know, reminder to, chew, to use the jewelry, chew on the necklace, not make the sounds. And that might be a little bit better from a social perspective. Yes, Cora and Monica, which one of you will answer, uh, read this question? Yeah, hello, here's from Cora, Germany. you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, this I could hear a, you. Yeah, this is a question from Romy Fisher and she asked here uh, if the book will be in a German translation, we cannot give an answer on that because it, it doesn't exist yet uh, in German uh, in German language. So perhaps we have to force or to ask uh, one of the publishers who are interesting in, in these kind of books. And this same question comes later again. Somebody else also asked uh, if the book is in German language. It is not available in German. So I'm sorry. Okay, this is another question. Yes, I see that. This is uh, about running away again. Right. And uh, this family says they, they just don't uh, understand why the child always wants to run away. So what could be reason? A reason I, I don't know. You know, again, I would need a lot more information to, uh, to answer such a specific question. But um, I would spend less time worrying about the reason unless something, you know, is distressing like a certain time of day or certain topic in school, you know, that you might want to think about changing that time of day. But I would focus more on preventing it, um, maybe doing some social stories about like, you know, how we want you to behave. And if you need a break from the classroom or you need a break from the house, here's what you can do, that kind of thing. Yes, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Cora. And I will just uh, go to one mail, what we got before uh, this our webinar. Uh, uh, one mother uh, is worrying so much because her son, seven years uh, old, has been ex exhibiting extreme behavior, aggression, hitting, pushing, destruction of property, throwing objects, uh, turning over a desk, uh, tearing up books, uh, and leaving or refusing to leave areas of the school. At school, in his general education, first grade, class and occasionally in other settings as well lunch art uh, it's it's a long long mail from the mother and explain what uh, they try to do in the school but maybe I will just come to the this uh, summary what she wrote uh, uh, they have tried behavior intervention with some success but he's still being removed from the class uh, for the safety of the of the other children multiplied times each week they want to move him to the speed program. How can they and we support positive behavior in the school? Is moving him to the more restrictive environment the only or best solution? At home, it's not like that. It's a little bit different with mother. It's much more different than mother work, but it looks like a lot of things start in the school. Yeah, so, you know, again, it's from a couple thousand miles away and not having ever met this child, I, I can't really say why, you know, it's happening. Um, 
And I also, I don't think it would be fair to me, fair of me, excuse me, to tell you what classroom would be the best for your child having such little information. I would say, you know, talk with your pediatrician. Uh, if there's a Down syndrome clinic in your area, I would, I would meet with them um, and consider, you know, your options. But I, I, again, I don't, I can't really answer that question with, with that amount of information. And I, I would never want to say something incorrect and, and give you the wrong advice with, without knowing the full story. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, one question is the okay. Now this is one program. Is the ABBA approach recommended? ABBA is a uh, is American program, if I remember well. Uh, oh, ABA. Mostly, yeah. Yes, I I guess I guess uh, I don't know something else. Maybe. Yes, I see. ABA, maybe yeah. you know. Yeah, ABA. Yes. Yeah, ABA can be great. ABA was originally developed for people with, with um, intellectual disability, including Down syndrome. So it can be a very effective tool. It depends on the child and it depends on the type of ABA. There's lots of different types. So it depends on what the child needs. But in general, yes, it's a good, good um, program. But again, it could be very different depending on what the child needs and what the specific ABA program is including. Yes, uh, maybe I will in the next uh, few minutes, I will just, uh, I'm, I'm, no, it's so many questions. Uh, well, I have about two or three minutes on my end. So do we want to do like maybe two yes, more questions? Yes, yes, I'm just, but it's really, it's a uh, most, I could say similar uh, things like we have. Okay, lady wrote Elizabeth at CB cerebral plasty, but I don't know what, uh, she would like uh, to do to say more well, about actually, it. Actually, I'm getting a couple questions here. Yes. That, okay. So let me address this. So I'm getting yes. a couple questions about you know can people meet with me um, remotely and and unfortunately the answer to that is no um, because I'm only licensed in Massachusetts in the United States. So for me to see patients, because I this comes up a lot after I do presentations, you would have to, you the family would have to physically be in Massachusetts for me to work with you. So I'm not allowed to see patients, you know, in other states and abroad. That's not how it, the my licensing works. Um, so you know, I I wish there were more resources out there. I, I imagine that there, you know, your your organization. I would hope and assume has some, you know, lists of people that might be available. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as you can imagine, we get requests from all around the country and the world. And, you know, we, we can't, the, the purpose of the book, which I hope is helpful to all of you, um, was to share the information. You know, the information is not just in my head. Um, so I hope that can be helpful, but unfortunately, again, the answer to that is that I, I can't see patients from other states and other countries. Uh, do you see that there is some more interesting question in, that we may, maybe didn't cover until now? Do you wanna do one last question? Yeah, how we can help children with Down syndrome to avoid the dangers? Don't pay attention. She's on the street, for instance. The dangers of this on the street. How they don't. Uh, how avoid the dangers. Uh, how to help them in this. Uh, they pay much more attention on, on the all dangers. Um, I'm not. I'm just trying to find uh, the question. Oh, how do we help them to avoid danger? Okay. Oh, I see. Danger situation. Yeah. So again, you know, there are strategies that you can try, like teaching with video, with social stories that you make. But a lot of this is also just thinking really practically. You know, if a child is not safe walking down the street, you might have to think about, okay, do we need, you know, a stroller? Do we need to always be holding hands? Do we need to avoid certain streets? You know, that kind of thing. Um, you have to kind of 
we can't fix everything with a behavior strategy. Sometimes we just have to think practically about, especially when it comes to safety, you know, what is going to just make this situation safe for now. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, will the book be translated into language like French? Uh, yeah, that is uh, upon the association or maybe uh, some companies who uh, book, book shelters that could maybe make this. Um, I don't know, Cora, is this in the German something what uh, you could help from Tanya? Ah, this is the same like book for, uh, in the Dutch. No, there is Dutch. one question about um, uh, imitating. Uh, the child is imitating uh, the um, uh, teachers and so on. How to react is the question. Mm -hmm. Imitating a negative? Uh, um, what yeah. would be a... It, it looks like it is negative, though I think it's not. It can be also a strength. Should put him in the theater course, I would say. Yeah, you know, obviously we would expect the teachers are not doing things that are so negative that it would cause problems if it were imitated. Um, so, um, you know, I think in general, again, the idea is to focus on positives, to um, think ahead about what the causes of the negative behaviors are, and to try and prevent them. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yes, so, um, Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, David, thanks a lot. Uh, really, it was very, very fantastic. And uh, like we always said, oh, we were looking forward to see you soon <laughs> in some another webinars because, uh, you know, never it's enough. It's always something what will be very nice uh, to remind and also to to work every day on some things and then uh, have a possibility maybe to speak with somebody and discuss about that. David, thanks, thanks a lot for your time and uh, be in touch, uh, I hope soon. Thank you very Thank much you for everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, who was uh, today to, with us on the webinar. Next webinar, it's uh, again uh, third, third Wednesday uh, in uh, next month. Be in touch and have a nice time and take care of yourself. Bye.